So this is something that normally is not done in Britain, which is that this is a town hall. And by the way, since there are empty chairs, if you guys want to give yourself just a little bit of room, you're welcome to do so. Uh, and I, it's interesting that we have this conversation now when we are only a week away from a major decision on what's going to happen with Brexit. So Nick Robinson, you and I have known each other for over 30 years. Too long. And actually, James, you and I have known each other also for an extended period. So you've got uh, the editor of The Times and the director of the BBC. You've got the gentleman who runs uh, the Today program. And I have to ask you as a way to start, and then this is going to involve all of you here because this is a town hall. Is the British press doing what it should be doing? Is the public as informed? Or to be blunt, are you asleep on the job? Or worse yet, biased? <laughs> is, is, is this a multiple choice, explain, Frank? I don't yeah. know you, which one do you tick of those three? Yes, you can take either of them. I should explain that James used to be my boss at the BBC. I am now still committed by law to be impartial, James has left. He can say anything he likes. It's great. Free. Um, all right, well, uh, Frank, so, I, so let me just run through the choices. Asleep at the switch, biased, or... Are you doing your job well? So, so the, the nature of a referendum, and I'm assuming we're talking here about the choice that was put to the British people um, in 2016, the nature of a referendum is incredibly difficult because the truth of it is, is you've got uh, one of two ways that you can vote, but a multitude of views that inform it. And so you will always find people, and we have found a huge number of people, who weren't happy about the coverage. In fact, one of the things I think that still unifies the country <laughs> is the sense of their dissatisfaction with the coverage. Look, I... I I, I should explain, as Frank said, I was the editor of the Times of London. I then moved, I uh, was the director of BBC News for uh, um, uh, the better part of five years. And then I left at the beginning of this year to try and start a different kind of news business. Um, and part of the thinking was how do you tackle the news differently? How do you think about not just breaking news, but what's driving the news? And how do you open up journalism to try and hear from more voices? So I'm in a sort of odd position here, Frank, which is, I want to try and explain and to a large extent also uh, stand by the BBC, the broadcaster I very proudly worked for. I've obviously also gone to do something different because I think there are different ways of doing the news and I think those different ways are needed. Are there British, let me just follow up. Are there British people getting what they deserve? I think if you start, you've got to start with your politicians, right? So let me let me be You're blunt. Still not I answering think, the question. No, no, I'm, I'm just about to. I think that we are seeing both in the UK and the US, we are seeing the two central pillars of our democracy, both the press and the political party, fundamentally broken, right? Their their bond of trust with the people is broken, and so in that sense, are we as a citizenship fully and properly informed? I don't think so, and I think that we need to do something about that. How much that is about the gaming of the media by people in politics and how much that is the responsibility of those in the media to call that out, well, I guess that's what we're going to spend the next hour talking about. And Nick, the challenge is not just to be fully informed. The challenge is to ensure that the information is accurate, that it is expansive, and that people are, are given the chance to learn what they need to know, even if it's not what they're asking for. Are you doing your job? Curiously, on that test, I think the answer is yes. So in other words, if you are a politically engaged citizen, if you want to know the detail of the debate about now, for example, the Prime Minister's Brexit deal, you can find that not just on the BBC, I might say, but on a whole series of other news sites as well. Not only are there long explainers, not only do we run a thing called Reality Check in the US, it would probably be called a fact box or a fact check, which James initiated when he was uh, head of BBC News. There are a whole series of ways. In a way, I'm not sure I think that's the test. The test is whether people who are not hungry for that level of information, who are not heavy news consumers, will come across it. Now, there are two different things going on at the same time, aren't there? 
On the one hand, news consumption is down. So the tradition that when I was uh, at Oxford with you, where there were three TV channels, and essentially there was still a habit of watching the bulletin in the evening, you know, with mom and dad at home, a watch it has disappeared, as we know, and in its place has become a completely new form of media consumption. And in that atmosphere, how you get information to people becomes difficult. This particular challenge was greater because there are also several things going on at the same time. There was, on the one hand, a detailed debate about uh, the detail of a very, very complicated relationship, not just on trading relationships, but other things. There was, underlying that, um, a much broader debate about Britain's sense of itself, outward looking, inward looking, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But underlying that was a rage and anger that we're seeing across the Western world. We see um, underlying some of the trends in the US, certainly some of the trends that are happening across Western and Eastern Europe, which is anger with uh, flat living standards, anger with the banking crisis, anger with uncontrolled migration, etc. So the issue then is. What's your test? Is your test on one, two, or three? It's all three, I imagine, but they are different. So I'm gonna, I feel like I'm Jeremy Paxman, and I went through this with him, and I actually got interviewed by him, and I was gonna tell him, thank you very much for never treating me badly. I was told if I'd said that to him, he would have treated me badly. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna ask you again, and then I'm gonna, you know what? I'm gonna turn it over. I wanna vote from you all. Does the media provide you what you deserve? Who says it does? Raise your hands. One, two, three, four, five. Who says it does not? Two, four, six, eight, ten. Well, okay, so they're obviously not satisfied. Oh, sure, and they should be not satisfied, and I'm not satisfied. You can always do better. What? what Here, how would you do better then? Okay, so the difficulty of the last two years, both the campaign itself and arguably the argument now, is what is the obligation of a broadcaster, I'm gonna talk particularly about broadcaster here, which is by law in the UK, and it's not just the BBC as a effectively, um, we're not state finance, the money comes from a, a sort of compulsory levy, but it is, a, if you like, in inverted commas, the closest that Britain has to a state broadcaster. What is the obligation, given that we have a legal obligation to balance fairness and impartiality in, in the way that is not the case in the US? Is it our obligation to cover the campaigns fairly, i.e. there are two sides in an argument or a referendum, and we must make sure that we cover both of their points each day? Or is it the argument to go deeper than that and look at the underlying truths? I think there is always a problem with political coverage in every country I've ever looked at. We over cover the horse race, too much horse race. We're attracted to controversy. So whether it's Trump in the US or Farage in the UK or Alex Salmond or Ken Livingston, we are attracted to people who give 20 seconds of controversialism. That is a problem. And there is too little desire to look at the underlying trends because we're in favour of what changed that day. So that is a critique I would make of media coverage in general. Um, and we do our best to do it better. So I have an issue with the newspapers here which is The Guardian and The Telegraph, it's as though they're two different events. And that there's something wrong. I understand that you have different conclusions. I understand when the editorial page is different. But the actual front page of the newspaper, it's as though I'm watching two different occurrences. And you've had that for years. Is that healthy for British democracy? Uh, okay, well, firstly, this is turning out to be much more fun than I hoped. So I... <laughs> Uh, uh, let, let's, let's start. First, I'm feeling my inner Alexander Hamilton here. I'm not satisfied. I will never be satisfied. We're no, none of us will ever be satisfied, I and hope, we shouldn't be. I right? hope That's... your future ends up better than his. <laughs> <laughs> he, had a, you know, he had a run. Um, <laughs> uh, 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 not least in the Apollo Victoria. He, um, look, look, of course, you know, when we ask ourselves, are we satisfied with our media? Right? The answer, of course, is no, and it should be no on two grounds. One is that look at the state of the world. Right? You know, I hope that the reason why we're here today is because we're struggling with the fact that there have been, it's been a generation of extraordinary change and net a huge positive 
era of progress, and yet you look around and the levels of justified frustration and in some cases despair is rooted in what's happening in technology, in natural resources, in longevity, in identity, in finance. There are really big problems. And if you, if you take an interest in the media, you take an interest in the world, and you should be asking yourself or tell, saying to yourself it's not working and we need to do something about it. So that's one reason. And the second thing is, whatever you care about, the media needs to be doing more about it. Right, that is that's by the nature of our media. It's the lens through which we look at things. We should be we should be activist, and we should be asking our media to do more. So, I think when we sort of show of hands, who's getting what they need? Everyone should be saying we need more. Right, that's what that's part of the nature of a democracy that's questioning the society we're in. But but on your specific question about the papers, Frank, I mean the truth is that. Actually, this is one of the areas where I think the, the British media or the British public square works, right? We have essentially two systems in place when it comes to the freedom of the press. We have a freedom of the press, as described by Frank, which is the Guardian and the Telegraph. They are the original filter bubble, right? Before we had a filter bubble, we had a filter bubble called Fleet Street. And essentially, it provided different ways of looking at what was happening in the world. And it's right to do so dates back to John Wilkes, and the fundamental principle of it was freedom of expre expression and freedom of opinion. When a new technology came along nearly 100 years ago called broadcasting, the government of the day looked at the prospect of that technology taking off and thought people like me, journalists, might have control of it, and they were terrified. They thought proprietors and editors would be able to control the life of the minds of our citizens, and they thought we can't have that. And they created the BBC, they established the licensing model, and with that they established a system of regulation. And so to this day, when Nick and I worked together at the BBC, we operated under a regulated system, while the papers operated under, uh, under the principles of a free press. And you have that tension between, if you like, John Wilkes's press and John Reed's press. And the combination of the two, if you like, re responsibility to the public square, in the case of the BBC, a responsibility to freedom of expression, in the case of Fleet Street, is actually, I think, a very healthy tension in the media. So it's good that you have the Guardian in the Telegraph. Yes. It's good that you have... Yeah, no, I agree. But, but the yes, facts... Yes, absolutely. Not only is it good, it's essential, Frank, for this reason. Britain is the um, mirror image of the United States. In the United States, there are um, city monopolies, often, of newspapers, and they're staggeringly boring, most of them. Yeah. Uh, they are breathtakingly boring things to read. Um, they make... Uh, they make sort of muesli sound really good when your mother's recommending it and having broccoli and all that sort of thing. I mean, the New York Times headlines, how can anybody think any of those things are actually headlines? So they're really, 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 American newspapers are, are admirable journalism, often great features analysis, boy, they're dull. Um, now, the counteract, uh, what has happened in at least the last, what, 20 years since Reagan changed the balanced speech am amendment, uh, was they went from a regulated model of broadcasting to a Fleet Street style of broadcasting in which Republican activists now watch Fox News. I think we're up to about three quarters of Republican activists watch Fox News as the primary source of their information. A slightly smaller proportion from memory, about half of liberal activists and Democrat activists get their news from MSNBC or CNN. Now, I actually think that is less healthy. Neither are ideal, but I think that's less healthy than we have in the UK, where at least the principal source of information, not just the BBC, mind you, Sky News, commercially owned, ITN, commercially owned, um, the other smaller providers, do have some sort of public responsibility to try and provide people with shared facts so that at least there is a public debate that can take place on the basis of shared facts and an appreciation of other points of view rather than of censorship. Now, it has downsides. The biggest downsides of the British model of broadcasting is we have a historic bias in favour of the conventional wisdom of the day. Whoever you are in politics, you tend to think is a bias against your party or your philosophy. If you look back... Actually, it's a bias in favour of conventional wisdom. So in its very early days, the BBC kind of thought the general strike was a bad thing. 
So John Reith, who was the founder of the BBC in 1926, helps the Prime Minister to make a persuasive broadcast against a strike. Uh, Churchill uh, it was very angry. It wanted to close the BBC down at one stage because we didn't think we were supportive enough of the government and said it was an outrage uh, that um, you couldn't, as he put it, be impartial between the fire and the fireman. And that has gone on all the way through a sense that the BBC, for example, let me take one from the left and one from the right, the BBC did not see Thatcher economics coming and was deeply sceptical about it, but equally, the BBC, like the whole of the rest of society, was rather slow on the green movement or on gay rights or on all sorts of liberal left changes that happened as well because there was a kind of bias in favour of the conventional wisdom. Not conscious, not deliberate, not laid down from the centre, not somebody pulling a lever and saying, you will now say this, so, but that's what happens. So I don't know how many, who's British here, but I'm just going to ask the question. The BBC, biased towards the left, biased towards the right, unbiased. Who says BBC is biased towards the right? Raise your hands. Zero. Who says it's biased towards the left? Raise your hands. Well, Nick, they don't agree with you. Because they're totally unrepresentative of the British public, because all the polling shows that that is not what the British public think. This has been polled again and again and again. And uh, with all respect, ladies and gentlemen, that is not what the British public think. The British public think <laughs> that... Um, Can I say something? Just, yeah. I, know, I don't, I don't want to... Obviously, it's a... Oh, sorry. It's a small room, and the exit is over there, which puts us <laughs> in a slightly difficult spot. But I'm going to have to tell you something. You're old. Because if you take a if you take a room of people under thirty five, right, they will all say that, that the BBC was biased as well, right? But ninety percent would say they're biased to the right. So there is a so it's, I'm not saying that the people don't think the BBC is biased. I'm just saying there's an incredible generational split between people essentially who are over forty think that uh, uh, they we were biased to the left and under under forty to the right. Because I mean this is not. In one sense, this is not terribly complicated, is it? Which is because the BBC, partly, once you've got the name British Broadcasting Corporation, once you're set up by a royal charter, once you're funded by a compulsory tax or levy, clearly, if you are anti-establishment from the left, that sounds pretty right-wing. That sounds pretty establishment. Uh, you know, and, and in some senses, it is. If, on the other hand, you're a free marketeer who thinks Britain is kind of stuck halfway between Sweden and the United States and you want it to look more like the United States, sure, we look rather left-wing because we seem to represent a kind of liberal, welfareist, metropolitan, elitist establishment view. But, but believe me, there are as many people who disagree with you as agree with you, and most of the polling shows it's about even. But can I just, just say one thing? that was, so, uh, so I remember not long after I joined the BBC, I sat there, and the one thing the BBC is really good at is measuring this stuff, right? They spend ages, and you get these just terrifying decks, you know, that, are, that arrive prior to the board meeting. Here are the decks on our impartiality and bias scores, right? And there was always a very interesting um, gap between impartiality and bias. Right? So, so the BBC, there, it would be something like 8.2 out of 10 was the impartiality score. Right? So you're in the 80s on impartiality. Right? But, but, but when I was there, at least, you'd see these bias scores that would say 27% of people thought you were biased. You thought, how, how's that possible? Right? Nearly a third of people are saying you're biased, but, only, but, but, but fewer than one-fifth think that you're, impar they think you're partial. What, what, what does that mean? And what we discovered over time was that we were measuring two totally different things, which goes to, I think, the heart of the problem in our politics and as relates to our media. Impartiality, we still measure Republican, Democrat, conservative labor. We measure largely about our associations with political parties. And the truth is that the great generational change has been that when I first started voting, two thirds of people had an identification with a political party. Today, that's a third, right? Most people don't see themselves in party terms. They don't see themselves in left and right, right? But the 
identity politics and the extent to which they do care about whether it is gay marriage or the queen or uh, the hijab or the burqa, these things are incredibly powerful. And funnily enough, actually, identification with public service or the private sector, these things are really powerful. And what you will see is very high numbers of around bias against particular communities. And I think if you track the rise of social media, digital media, what digital media has done is it's, it's ended that sense that you are alone in the world, it's created communities around identity, and it's reinforced narratives uh, of exclusion and bias. And so that's why you've got bias scores that can be quite a good deal higher than your partiality scores. And the reason I mention it for everyone in the room, you don't have to be in the media or, the broad or a broadcaster to be dealing with that issue. That's there ended the party political broadcast on behalf yes. of the BBC. Okay, this is meant to be a town hall. So please keep your comments to 30 seconds. You can ask a question or make a comment, but now it's your turn and they're going to respond to you. Who wants to go first? Right there. Sorry, given the uh, echo chamber of social media and the internet and what's that created in politics, how relevant is this discussion? You mean, does, does it, do we still matter, as it were, to put it crudely? <laughs> oh, I think it, I, I think it still matters. There are two different things here, aren't there? Do, do broadcasters matter? Do, do, do the newspapers still matter? Broadcasters still matter because it's still the case that predominantly people get as the primary source of their news, they get it from broadcast news, and the news that they trust is broadcast news. That remains the case. Now, when I, I used to be political editor of the BBC, um, when I began that job, the audience for the 10 o'clock news, the main news, was probably four and a half to five million a night. It's now probably more three and a half to four, so it's a decline, but it's still a hell of a lot of people. And there's a lot of influence, and there's a lot of belief. So, yes, it's still does matter and the newspapers matter too because it is still the case although their readership has dropped that the most original journalism often the most the drive to investigations to campaign on certain causes is almost always still driven by newspapers yes there's some very good powerful websites that can do it too but the idea that social media has replaced this i've always regarded as for the birds i just don't think there's evidence for it the, 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 only, the only way I would, because it's easy to see, I mean, I think if you're looking in terms of delivery of news, the Nick's absolutely right. If you're thinking about politics as opposed to news, if you're thinking about political outcomes, right, that's much more complicated. So, so I can't talk with, with any insight in terms of the politics of the United States. But there is, if you're really interested in this, an extraordinary blog post by Dominic Cummings, who was Michael Gove's special advisor and then the architect of the Vote Leave campaign. And many of you, or some of you may have read it, it's quite long. But the, the thing that it was amazing is it looked back at the thinking behind the Vote Leave campaign. And what it said was that Vote Leave campaigned around a very clear set of ideas. They campaigned around anger in the wake of the financial crisis, concern about uh, EU migration and, oh sorry, um, uh, migration from North Africa and Syria and the failure to deal with Greece. Right? These are amazing things because that was not what the subject of the day-to-day -day news or the debate was here. The debate was around sovereignty, it was around immigration, it was around you know, uh, inefficiency or corruption in Brussels. It, those were the fault lines in the debate. That was not what drove the Vote Leave campaign. And the interesting thing is there is a divergence here, and you're seeing it obviously you know, on steroids from where we stand in the United States. That seems to be the case, a, a political argument that is intentionally divorced from what's happening, if you like, in public policy and the news. So here's, here's what's great about the Milken Institute. You spoke of the Vote Leave campaign. Yeah. In the front row is the campaign manager for the Vote Leave campaign. <laughs> is That's he an interesting summary. Um, you failed to mention take back control. That was our central message of the campaign. But, yes, it was, Matthew, but the point is, what was the emotion driving it? So, the re if, so, at least when I read Dom's thing, the thing that was really striking to me was it was about taking back control, and the emotions that were fired up around take back control were not actually around 
uh, the UK sovereignty message. That was the outcome, right, that if you read Dominic, and I know Dominic a bit, he was getting, getting at. In order to get there, and, and sorry, sorry, I didn't hear your name. Zach. Zach. In order to get there, to Zach's point, the, the campaign was running a, uh, an argument or a set of feelings that was actually fundamentally different. It wasn't about the strength of British sovereignty after the Brexit. It w that was not the argument that Vote Leave put to people. But it wasn't about mi migration either. It was about taking back control and independence. And it was a better word for sovereignty, which, of course, people wouldn't, wouldn't understand. I'm going to beg to differ here. Matthew, it's your campaign and all that, but it seems to... I remember going into... I'll give you a little anecdote, and anecdotes prove nothing, but little anecdotes. I remember going in to speak to James's point to the newsroom when the images were of migrants from North Africa coming in huge numbers across the border in Germany, coming down the motorway. It was the only time I correctly predicted the referendum results. I'm not going to claim omniscience because, in fact, I did not correctly predict that. At that point, I went to the office and say, that's it, vote leave will win. And somebody in my office, and this, in fact, speaks to Frank's point about whether the BBC always gets it right, said to me, hold on, immigration from Africa um, has nothing to do with the EU certainly has nothing to do with free movement. Uh, and I said, you know, by the way, I'm not that stupid. I'm, I'm aware of that, but it has everything to do with the emotional power of the take back control of our borders. And it had everything to do with why a poster about Turkey, which Vote Leave did produce, suggesting that they're about to join and that if they joined, 8 million people could come. That was why that poster had power. Without the imagery in the social media of the sense of, my God, look who's coming, which is precisely what Donald Trump did with the um, border yeah. and the caravan, the messaging about Turkey would have been completely irrelevant. It would have made no sense to people at all. It required, in other words, both a reality, which is that Europe wasn't really in control of its external border, that's a reality, an anxiety of people in the country because of flat real wages and of cultural phenomenons to do with terrorism and other things. But it also took vote leave, frankly, to exploit both of those because political campaigns do exploit emotions on both sides. I think it would be fair to say that um, migration was um, one element that drove the leave vote. I'm not denying that. Just as um, you know, love for the European institution would be one element that drove the Remain vote probably for a smaller fraction of people. But if you look at the people in the centre, those swing voters who actually determine the campaign, I would say that um, people's heart was basically saying they didn't particularly like the EU, but their head was saying, you know, what will happen to the uh, economy? So during the campaign, you know, describing that you know, the status quo wasn't an option and talking about how the EU was going to continue integrating, how David Cameron um, hadn't managed to get any uh, powers back from the EU, um, you know, how he could take back control, um, I would say that was a more powerful factor in terms of influencing those centre-ground swing voters than migration. Did they mistreat you? It's interesting. Yes or no? Can I have more than 30 seconds on that? No. Because it's, <laughs> it's a difficult question to answer. Because, um, so for example, you know, Nigel Farage is famously, I think, the, the most um, frequent person to appear on Question Time. So you can't deny that Eurosceptics don't appear on Question Time. But at the same time, I would have an issue with who represents the Leave side. So I was unhappy having Nigel Farage on there, because I thought that for those swing voters you want to win, you want more moderate voices. So uh, one of my big beefs with the um, BBC during the campaign was we wanted to put up business people. Now, we would get phone calls saying we've got the ex-head of, uh, sorry, the, 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 the chairman of a big FTSE company appearing for the Remain campaign um, on the BBC. You need to give somebody uh, to us who's of equal standing to that FTSE chairman. Now, of course, most of the FTSE chairmen are on the Remain side we had lots of people who are SME leaders and smaller business leaders who want to put up, and often they weren't acceptable for the BBC because they weren't of sufficient standing. And it was only during the short campaign where we insisted that basically we had our guys up, knowing full well that these guys are more trusted by ordinary voters, that we actually got that change. So often the, the bias is not so much in the, it's in who's selected to speak up for a certain issue rather than the issue not being covered. 
So, so, so very quickly, Matthew. I mean, look, the, the point I made right, right at the beginning about an, a referendum being binary, but there being a multitude of sides within it, is obviously this this issue about that. That was, you know, one of the liveliest, let's put it that way, in dealing with vote leave and leave.eu. That, you know, even worse than getting someone on the Remain side for you guys was often getting someone who was from that, you know, Farage camp. Um, I'm not sure it's exactly right, actually, about Nigel Farage on Question Time, but obviously he's been up there many times. Uh, I think, you know, just going back to Zach's point, I think we're, we're in danger of just talking past each other. The real point here is about how politics has become emotional and how does the media provide, you know, to Frank's original question, give people what they deserve, right? But if you like, in chasing the news, end up missing the story. And, and it seems to me that in our politics, what we're seeing are some really clever people making calculations that are emotional to have political ends. And how does the news deal with an emotional politics which has political ends? And that poses real dilemmas. I think James puts his finger on something that poses real dilemmas for us. Because why the BBC, and all broadcasters, by the way, but the BBC in particular, is sometimes seen as biased by some people is that we don't appear to share their emotional reaction. So they think that we don't share it, therefore we must be biased against it. So if you are um, deeply, passionately of the view that gay rights is wrong, you see a gay actor on your screen, you see a discussion with a gay person, which is normal, it's like, what's wrong with these guys? Mm. You know, they're obviously against God, or my version of God. Um, and that applies on immigration. If you get people saying, oh, well, look, here are the statistics, and this year it wasn't that big, and by the way, here's an economist who tells you that immigration is good for the economy of, uh, for UK PLC, that you don't actually start to listen when you say, what do you deserve? What do people deserve from the media? Here's the question. Do people deserve an economist saying, no, 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 um, Mr. and Mrs. Public, we don't care that you feel uncomfortable that a lot of people in your town and they don't speak the same language as you and your son thinks his wages have gone down and you think the clinic in your <clears throat> your local doctors is more overcrowded. We don't care that because here is a macroeconomist to tell you that UK PLC is better off net as a result of immigration. Now, which is our duty? Some people tell us it's our duty to do that because that is the intellectually, they say, sound response. Other people say, no, no, you must reflect this anger. Now, my view is we've got to do both. My view is that take immigration. <coughs> Forgive me, the BBC made a mistake, and I've written this before, there's no great revolution in this, about 15, 20 years ago, when in the mid-90s there was the beginning of a discomfort. In that stage, at that time, it was about the asylum system being out of control, actually, under New Labour. Then again, when the East European countries joined the EU and we didn't have transitional controls, constantly the BBC allowed itself to look as if it was saying, you're wrong to be unhappy. You have got this wrong. That was an error. Actually, by the time, funnily enough, the referendum came round, we'd stopped doing that years previously. We really weren't doing that. But it is equally the case that it isn't good enough, and the reason I don't want us ever to go down the foxification of broadcasting in this country, to just play back to people what they want to hear, which is often inaccurate, untrue and prejudiced. That was kind of my question, but um, I I'm, I'm live in the States and I should have known, but I didn't know about that Reagan Act when Nick, you said of the of the two, you would take the, the British model. And I've been thinking about what which I would take. I think I agree, and I think just for the reasons you said, the emotion is much more profitable to get people riled up on TV than it is in newspapers, or effective, maybe, and, and profitable by, by definition. Um, I'm curious, Frank, what you think, Ingrid, what you think other Americans think. I just have never really thought through the process, but a paper is a place for long opinions and, and ideas, and I'm okay with that. It's like an editorial, but news is emotional, and similar to what we learned at lunch, is people trying, giving you a slice of time and getting people riled up to increase ratings, as we know. Slight nerdy point, but I'll make it short. 
there was something called the balanced speech amendment. It was imposed by the FCC and under Reagan. It was not done directly by Reagan, but he reappointed many of the people who ran the FCC. The balanced speech amendment was removed. That allowed the creation of Fox News and therefore the creation of MSNBC. Before that, balanced speech meant what it said, balanced speech, which is broadly the networks had to be balanced. Now, clearly, there are plenty of people who thought it was balanced in a, quote, liberal direction, but there was a change in the regulatory framework. In the States, this year, 2018, was the lowest level of credibility. When, you, when Americans are asked, do you have faith and trust the media to tell you the truth, it's at an all-time low. Do you have faith and trust in the media to be unbiased and, equal and balanced, it's at an all-time low. That's not happening here in Britain? Yes, it is. Why is it happening? Well, look. Let's look at some other things that are happening. Levels of not just anger, but hatred within politics. Right? So polarization, not between political parties, but within them. Right? We're seeing these, these extremely strong moves in, frankly, in both, of our big, both sets of our big political parties. Um, and there is enormous frustration. And, and that's why I go back to this point, Frank, at the beginning. You know, I think we're two steps behind in the debate we're having. Right, we are having a, we, we've been having a debate now, set in no small part by the President of the United States around news. Uh, you know, I worry that a catchphrase actually distorts a set of deep and you know, structural problems that the media needs to fix. But the reason I feel as though we're two steps behind is that the, the, the other pillar of our democracy is the political party. And in the way in which the media has been essentially disrupted by uh, digital technology, that is happening now to the political party. And if we don't see it and do something about it, we are going to see the second step in the decline in public trust in our democracies. Because we are, you know, uh, you know I assume that most of us in this room are, uh, have lived through what's happened in the US or in the UK. Wherever you sit on the political spectrum, what is really striking is the, lev the number of people who do not have confidence that the outcomes in 2016 in both of our countries were just and fair. Um, okay, <clears throat> I guess it's a, it's a common and a question, both related, but with regards to the Vote Leave campaign, and specifically that poster, it felt like the BBC, one of your responsibilities, which I think was achieved, was to clarify what was truthful and what wasn't. And because of that, you were almost accused of bias, but it was actually stating the truth that, look, this is not about North Africa and migrants from there. And then related to that, as a result of Brexit and the outroar and outrage since then, do you feel like you've had to step away from experts, having experts on the programme because of this, you know, um, we reject elite, we reject experts going on and talking about it? And I just say this because, so I'm an economist, I, I go on the BBC occasionally to talk about economic issues that happen. And at the end of each interview, I'm asked, so if I go on to talk about oil prices, I'm always asked at the end of it, well, you know, what's the other side of it? So I'm, I feel like I have to go on to give a very balanced view, though, even though as an economist, and somebody in asset management, I have to have a very strong view, but I'm forced now to give a very balanced perspective. Mm. It seems to me the whole debate, Michael Gove famously said, you know, uh, and this is a, before Matthew corrects me, is taking him out of context, but became known for saying, you know, we've had enough of experts, of course, you know, it was not quite what he did say, but that's what it became known as. The, the downside of the reaction to that was, well, let's be sceptical about what everybody says, and let's just, just say, you know, maybe you're talking tosh, maybe this is fake news, maybe your predictions are wrong. Um, I think it was right and proper that we did give more consideration to what forecasts and predictions were indeed scientific and had a high degree of probability and what were kind of fingers in the air. And it was important because the media tends to be manned uh, and womaned by liberal arts graduates rather than by people who have any sense of numbers at all. And sometimes there is a tendency to be credulous about numbers. I mean, I, I used to have arguments with the BBC when somebody put a decimal point in our GDP figure. I went, look, broadly a 20-year projection of a figure which is 115 billion pounds. The decimal point's not doing a lot of good for us here. So we don't have people who understand numbers that well often, and I, I'm probably not that good at it either. Um, but 
Did we and should we have said things were not true when they were? Yes, and in my view, James and I have probably not had this debate. Um, we probably should have done it more than we did. Uh, I did say on Primetime BBC One, thank you, James, because he put me on in a half-hour documentary four days before the vote, I held up the 350 million poster, I put a cross through it, and I said it was not true. It is, in my view, objectively untrue. It's not arguable, it's not the best. As long as you add the word send to Brussels. 350 million is totally arguable as a gross figure divided by 52, blah de blah But as soon as you say send to Brussels, it becomes untrue, because the figure is never sent to Brussels, never will be sent to Brussels, never was going to be sent to Brussels. It was untrue. And I said it was untrue on air. In my view, I would have been more aggressive than we were about that. I probably would have said, and this is with the benefit of hindsight, if Boris Johnson wishes to appear in front of an untrue statement on a bus, we're not going to film him there. We'll film him somewhere else instead, because this is a piece of propaganda that we can't really justify. Now, of course, if you do that, You've got to be pretty rigorous about the other side. On the same programme, I did say that the forecast that we'd all be £4,300 a year worse off, produced by the Treasury, was tosh as well. Um, so we have to be consistent. On the Turkey claim, I didn't say it was untrue. I said it was certainly arguable because Turkey hadn't signed up. Um, and uh, before they did, there were all sorts of barriers to the possibility of large numbers of immigrants coming from Turkey to the UK. So it is our job to stick confidently to where we can do facts, but be clear where we can and not mistake facts for general conventional wisdom. Can, can I add, so, so what's your name? Seema. So, Seema, uh, so one of the things that I'm really haunted by as a journalist in terms of something that I did was I, uh, I was the FT's, well, the way I know uh, Frank from, I was the FT's Washington bureau chief. I used to cover the White House. And in the run-up to the Iraq war, I remember going and sitting in the White House briefing room, and you know normally you get the press secretary, but when they want to land it, they'll roll out someone bigger. And on that day, I remember the White House rolled out Condoleezza Rice. And Condoleezza Rice, this was at the time that Hans Blix was you know, questioning whether or not Saddam Hussein did or didn't have weapons of mass destruction. And Condoleezza Rice used this sentence. She said, you know, we don't want to get to the point where the smoking gun is a mushroom cloud. And I remember going back and sitting down and writing the top line of the story, right? And how is that not the top line of the story, right? The National Security Advisor has essentially invoked the image of Hiroshima, right, in terms of talking about this, right? So this is a person in, of enormous power. They have oversight of the uh, US uh, military, and they use that phrase. Now, at that moment, she and the US administration didn't have any more information or evidence than they had 24 hours ago, right? One of the difficulties that you're pointing to is how do you choose not to broadcast? How do you choose not to write a subject? And on what basis do you do that, right? So actually, the truth was that in the case of the 350 million, we made a decision. It popped up. It was reported. It was part of the vote leave argument. We then then did, as Nick said, challenge it. We then did stop broadcasting any pictures of politicians standing in front of the bus because it was obviously a device. If you go back, by the way, to that famous Dom Cummings blog, the point that he was making was that once that was in the water, it didn't matter whether the argument was about 350 million or 125. It was an argument, to Matthew's point, about taking back control. To any normal person, 125 million pounds is as much as 350 million pounds. And that's what I mean about mistaking something that's emotional for, for, for political. Um, the one thing I should say to you is, as an expert, please go on the BBC and just tell it as you see it. That is definitely the thing to do. So I actually, I'm going to take it down this row. Give them a word or phrase when someone says media, British media. Give them a word or phrase that comes to mind first. Can I go last? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good phrase for the British media. <laughs> <laughs> Educated. Extensive. Three words, better than America. <laughs> Overly nuanced. Uh, Unbiased. Unbiased, that was it. Thorough. Uh, interesting, I'd say bits missing. Unglamorous. <laughs> <laughs> That's just this panel. 
So you notice... Just because I have no hair. What are you saying? I'm not glamorous. So you notice that the Americans, and I've found this in the research I've done, the Americans think the BBC is the best. When you ask who is going to give you the most thorough information and most unbiased, if you include the BBC in the offering, BBC comes number one. So why is it that the American population thinks you're so great and the British population has serious doubts? So, so just so you're clear, Frank, they don't have serious doubts. Yep. The numbers, so, and I can simply say this personally, so w when I left the Times, right, the approval ratings of me as a journalist, right, were in the low 20s, right? <laughs> Two weeks later, I got a job at the BBC, suddenly they're in the low 60s. You know, it, the, the, the reality is, is that the British population has a fundamentally different view, and the reason why that, at a time of a general election or referendum, nearly 90% of people go to the BBC for the news is because its levels of trust are greater than that of any other news organisation uh, in this country. So I, I think, I, I don't, the, the, the thing I think, when you go back to Michael Gove, and he was saying, you know, we've had enough of experts, I think the thing that people are saying is, we've had enough of complacency. We've had enough of people in power being complacent, telling us it's all going very well, when it may be an aggregate, but not for the individual. And so I don't want to be complacent about the media, but I do want to say that actually public support and public confidence in the BBC is incredibly robust. Yeah, I, I want to say that um, uh, when you asked James why, where the levels of distrust, or you said where was the distrust in the British media in the way there is in America, it's growing in Britain, but there's nothing like the scale it is in America. And we, part of the reason is because the British media are not taking sides in a political argument in the way that clearly broadcasters are beginning to do. They did, first of all, on cable, but they're beginning to do in mainstream media as well. God help us if we ever do that. I never want us to, to do that. What's going on? I think James is right. First of all, in his aggregate point, and immigration is the classic example of that, where the expert says, you know, it's all good for you, and people say, it doesn't feel bloody good where I live. We had to find a way, and that is partly to do with a centralised country, it's partly to do with having, um, uh, you know, liberal, metropolitan graduates who dominate the media. There's a whole series of reasons I could give you for why that sort of conventional wisdom uh, is reinforced. We've got to be very careful, for example, on the whole issue about racial integration and about attitudes to Islam, that Britain, uh, the, the BBC isn't seen to do the same. I don't want us to chase Tommy Robinson, but on the other hand, I don't want us to appear to repress anybody's concerns that they think multiculturalism's gone too far. That's a debate they should be allowed to have on mainstream broadcasting. What they mustn't feel is that broadcasters are lecturing them, are telling them what to think, are saying these are the correct set of views. So I think there's two things going on. That A, and B, what James was saying earlier, which is political activists primarily getting their news from each other. I mean, you used to have to go to a constituency Labour Party meeting once a month in order to hear uh, you know, that there was someone else in the world who agreed with Tony Benn's views to nationalise most industries. You can do it within five seconds now. Well, one second. On social media. And when you discover you're not then hearing that on the BBC, well, the only possible conclusion is that we must be biased. Because all the people you know think this thing, and you're watching people on air who don't think this thing. So clearly... The media's bar. Now, do we chase that? No, but we acknowledge it. We're open to it. We challenge ourselves to be more open to ideas. If I were being hyper self-critical, Matthew kindly didn't say it, but he could have done. Did the BBC, and frankly, establishment broadcasting in general, take seriously the possibility of leaving the EU 10 or 20 years ago? Conceptually, intellectually, that this could happen and that there was argument about how it happened? Not really, no. Because the conventional wisdom was, it's like the weather. Not necessarily it's a good thing. I think it was a mistake to think the BBC thought membership of the European was a good thing. I just think they thought it was a given. It just was. And if you're ever challenging the conventional wisdom, you will always think the people who think things just are must be biased because they don't see it as you see it. My experience, you know, and anybody who knows me, you only have to check my Wikipedia page. Uh, you know, and Frank knows this, when I was a student, um, 
I was involved in Tory politics as a student, so I'm, I'm you know, would be considered unusual uh, in broadcasting. But it was, I don't detect, I just do not see evidence of partisan, political, organised bias in British broadcasts. I just don't see it, never have. I do sometimes see lazy thinking, uh, an unwillingness to challenge, an unwillingness to ask the opposite of the opposite question. But I see that in most walks of public life. I see that amongst lawyers, doctors, people in this room. Can, can I just do one thing? C can I just commission you to write that piece? <laughs> the, the, so the really interesting piece, if you think about it, is the idea of the mainstream media's bias being towards the conventional wisdom, right? And the reason I say that is, I think the thing that I find most unsettling about these times is that our the, the political framework that served me really well t through my 20s, 30s and 40s suddenly feels inadequate to the times we're in. That you're either seeing politicians and parties reaching for one ism or other of the 20th century, either a nationalism or a socialism or even an ism of the 19th century, liberalism. And if our media is skewed towards the conventional wisdom at a time of incredibly rapid change. The risk is that we are bound to be peddling ideas that are out of step with the needs of the times. And it just seems to me as though that is much closer to the issue that we're really dealing with rather than the classic, you know, bias of left or right, um, you know, fake news argument. That seems to me to get closer to the emotional issue that whether you're a Leave or a Remainer, you're voting on. What's, for me, what's fascinating is that the divisions that we have in the states, and there are divisions here, that this is a different issue. That how Americans view the media is fundamentally different than Britain. I did not realize that. And just issues of credibility and trust. I assume that you were going through the same type of re-examination and hostility, and it, apparently it is not. I hope that you stay this way because I will tell you, as someone who's seen it up front and knows the impact of what it has on the public, it's not a good thing. I think there's another quick example that reinforces Nick's point, and that, of course, is people saw um, Brexit as being unexpected, but also um, the election last year. Yeah. Um, people didn't think that Jeremy Corbyn was going to do as well as he did and thought the Tories were going to walk it with you know, a huge majority. Um, pr people perhaps didn't think that Jeremy Corbyn could possibly do well as leader. He'd been written off. And actually, when the public saw him during the campaign, in the point where all the party leaders got equal coverage, they actually quite liked him. Yeah, I think the, the framing of Corbyn, as it were, by the media was through a kind of, well, his party hate him. I mean, his parliamentary party hate him, clearly his activist base didn't hate him. This was true. It was not, this is why we have to be careful about the notion of bias. The reporting of Jeremy Corbyn was true, i.e. his shadow cabinet thought he was useless. They did. His parliamentary party wanted to remove him. They did. Most people who'd ever had power and uh, were from the left in this country regarded him as totally unelectable. They did. Most pollsters thought that all these things were true. So it was not biased to report them, but what there wasn't was the asking the fresh question, which is if we present these ideas afresh to people without the framing that says they were tried in the 1980s and they failed and he's left wing and Tony Blair was successful from the right without all those sort of built-in assumptions crudely if you took my own kids my kids are 18 21 and 23 and just said you know nothing about this guy have a look at him and what do you think about the government running the railways instead of the guys who are running at the uh, at the moment they they I'm not saying they they didn't in this case but people like them would then say that sounds perfectly reasonable, you know, what, what, what's wrong with that? Railways aren't run very well and he's, he seems to be against, uh, you know, rich people getting richer. I, I quite like the sound of that. And we didn't put our coverage enough through that additional frame. I think it's true in the United States, isn't it? Where the conventional wisdom is tariffs are bad. Trade wars are bad, they make you poorer. Any expert, you can't find other than, I've forgotten his name now, the guy who managed to get into the, the White House, the one man who agrees with him on tariffs. Navarro. Yeah, Navarro, yeah, thank you very much. Um, but we would, so we in coverage, I think if we were doing that, would have to say, well, look, this is what most economists, in fact, almost every economist other than Navarro will, will tell you. But we also have to say, there are some people who, in fact, there are an awful lot of people who think, 
not making your own steel means you're not a proper country. A question for, well, for both of you, if, if you like, but especially for Nick. I mean, to, to potentially uh, unfairly paraphrase your views of a couple minutes earlier, I mean, if you cling to this idea that uh, if you give us a diversity of views and we can't detect, we can't point at any clear sign of bias, and you've sort of upset everyone by not just parroting their views, then, you know, mission accomplished. I mean, given that we live in an age where we now know, you don't have to be a raving conspiracy theorist to know, that there are very organized groups using very large platforms to lie to us. I mean, the President of the United States uses Twitter to lie to us every day. The Leave campaign uh, told uh, demonstrable lies. Don't you then run the risk that if that's your standard, avoid being demonstrably partisan, you have effectively misled us because you've, you've laid yourself vulnerable to people trying to manipulate you. Yes, if that was what we do, but it isn't. So the great critique of impartial broadcasting, impartiality, is to confuse impartiality with balance. So the classic critique is if a guy goes and mows a, a lawn, you know, the impartial journalist has to interview one guy who says the grass is this high and another guy who says the grass is down there. It's a very funny caricature. There are lots of people on the left and right who say, the problem is we've never done it, it's not true, it's not what the BBC was in business for. Impartiality simply means that although I have views, we all have views, I have a background, uh, my schooling, my religion, my race, uh, my prejudices. I go to work aiming, that's all I can do, aiming to put those to one side and to get as close to the truth as I can that day or to represent the choices that people have to face in a way that they can determine the truth in their own way. What it certainly doesn't mean is that we get two people with opposite views who, as you say, sir, very accurately, may both be lying and may both have huge financial interests in doing so uh, and present them both and say, shucks, you guys, you make up your mind. That's not what I do. I don't think I've ever done that. And if we did do that, we should be out of business. It is, though, of course, what the platforms do. Um, you both mentioned polarization in society that you see. And it's interesting that it says partisanship as part of the title. And I look, I'm 20, I look at the people my age and I've seen how torn people are and how much anger there is on both sides for so many different reasons. And I wonder what you believe is the future of that. Because you mentioned Reagan, you know, you mentioned historical moments, but most people my age never picked up a history book apart from GCSE level. Uh, they've never read, they're not educated enough to look at the news and actually also be able to interpret it to them personally as well. And furthermore, as you know yourself, there's less and less people who are actually watching the news. They don't turn on the BBC at 9 p.m. They go on Facebook. And if they once clicked on Fox News, it's going to take them, the algorithm takes them sort of more right. If uh, they clicked on CNN, it takes them more left. It only reinforces their opinions rather than challenge it. So my question is, what do you think is the future after the Brexit hour beyond that? Well, my view is that the BBC in particular, I'm sorry, forgive me talking about the BBC, it's kind of my life. Um, we have to turn impartiality into what defines us. We have to boast about it. We have to explain it to a new generation of people. I mean, what I say to when I go into schools is, look, this is a very weird thing, impartiality. It is a limit on the freedom of the media. It is a political and legal imposition on the media. It's not natural, it's not the weather, whereas people of my generation tend to think it's like the sun coming up, you know, that's what the BBC does. Um, we have to say, there's a reason we do this, because here's the alternative. The alternative is a debate on healthcare in the United States, in which Fox News tells you that Obama wants to bring in socialist death panels, and MSNBC say Republicans want poor people to die. Now, I don't think that's a proper public debate. And the BBC doesn't always get it right, but we sure as hell don't do that. What we do try and do is have someone who reports on the facts. What is the state of healthcare? What's our GDP spend? How many people die? How does it compare with other countries? And as I say, my critique would sometimes be, are we imaginative enough about the questions we ask about how healthcare could be provided? Probably not. Probably too limited in it. But we don't say to people, uh, we don't put everything through a framing 
in the way that media does. But if we're to win that argument with your generation, forgive me, we have to say to you, we've got this really freaky idea that you can't just read anything you want, that you can't just go to the people who agree with you. We've got this freaky idea that there is a public space, a public good, and we want you to be proud of it too. Okay, we're out of time, but I'm going to give you one shot. So very quick, please. I mean, it's really, the clock is at zero. Okay, fine. So, 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 so if you look at the, uh, the architecture of both the Trump campaign and the Leave campaign, there are certain parallels which were somewhat worrying. But I think one of the m m core ones was that you needed to try and destabilize this view about the press being free, fair, uh, allowing accountability, and also allowing um, to be, like, unbiased information. So in some ways, do you think what's happened is that in order to destabilize the conventional thought in order to allow more fringe aspects to win, they've had this un unintended consequences of having the media actually start to question itself when, by all measures, you may not be doing that much wrong. Uh, I think that they, as in the politicians or the political campaigns, did not destabilize the media. I think that technology and fundamental changes in the way in which the media works and the way in which we get our information and ideas have destabilized things. Some politicians, more effectively than others, have exploited that and amplified it. Um, and uh, I still go back to the point, I suppose, that we are living in an age where there is some of the best journalism that I've ever seen, and that's ever been done, um, investigative, analytical, opinionated, but there is also a political game that is at odds with some of the traditional systems and principles of that media, and we have to think about how, how we address it. So I want to end with a compliment, which is, and both of you were at one point involved, Newsnight, as well as the Today program. And I'm supposed to be someone who's hostile, and maybe the sounds of the questions were hostile, but we don't have a program like that in America. Every single night, you investigate. And I want to end with a question about someone who did interview me, Jeremy Paxman. He became the story sometimes, where he asked, what was it, Michael Howard, the same question, I don't know, a dozen times? 14. 14 times. <laughs> oh, who's counting? Uh, is that performance journalism, or is that substantial journalism? Did you do the statute yesterday? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Just to let you know. So it's worth going back. If you can go back on the BBC uh, audio player, listen to Nick interview Sajid, right? Sajid Javid is our home secretary. Uh, it's, a, it's a very, very interesting example of how the media can actually unearth something very different about and a change in the weather about our politics. And it's possible to have a piece of performance journalism, right, which by nature a live radio broadcast is, um, but that can be profoundly revealing. What happened? That's very nice of you, thank you. I'm still trying to work out why you liked it so much, but that's very nice today. Um, yeah, of course there's performer. I mean, telly, it's a showbiz, you know? My job is radio. I mean, it's, you know, people are getting out of bed at six in the morning, they can, uh, they can switch on the music or not. Yeah, it's performance, we do a bit of performance, but it's performance with a purpose. It has to be performance in order to get, sometimes the theater in itself is part of the story. What you're wanting to do is to say, this person is not answering the question. I knew going in in advance they weren't going to answer the question, but I'm sure as hell going to illustrate that they're not answering the question. Sometimes I do that. Sometimes the question I do is much more open-ended and a genuine sense of inquiry as to what the answer might be. I mean, Jeremy said something I profoundly, profoundly disagree with. You'll remember who he's quoting. I can't remember the name of the uh, famous American he was quoting, which is when I see somebody, I think, why is this lying bastard lying to me? Which was E.L. Mencken, no. H.L. Uh, Mencken, I'm sorry, I'm tired. 3.30 in the morning, I got out of bed. H.L. Mencken. Um, that isn't my view. I don't think politicians are lying to me most of the time. I don't think it's my job to think they're lying to me most of the time. And I don't wish to live in a country in which people think their politicians are lying to them all the time. I actually am the boring guy who gets in a cab. And when somebody says, you know, Nick, and they do say this to me rather a lot, actually, rather less since I'm on radio than TV for other obvious reasons, um, they're all the same. They're all in it for themselves and they're all on the take. I occasionally really risk offending them by saying, do you know how boringly, tediously lazy that view is? It's lazy, it's 
dull, it's inaccurate, and we should challenge it. And we should have journalists that do that. Well, you are two of the best journalists in the UK. Thank you.